evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to the Future of Leadership live online seminar series presented by the STAR and organized by the Center for Asia Leadership. My name is Faustino John Lim, and today's webinar is on adaptive leadership, a four-part framework for your organization to make sustainable progress with our speaker, Samuel Kim. We have launched this webinar series during this crisis we are all facing whether you are in business, government, or nonprofit, to bring the insights and ideas from the Center for Asia Leadership Faculty Network in a way that is useful and accessible to all of you. I am pleased to welcome over 2,300 registrants from over 30 countries, from Australia, from the US, Dominican Republic, Peru, uh, the UK, Uganda, uh, and the nearby country where, where I'm from. Uh, from Vietnam. So we are re representing every continent and a very wide range of industries. Uh, if you are joining us for the first time, our center is an organization based out of Boston, United States, and Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, operating in several cities across Asia. We were founded at Harvard University among fellows and alumni, and we focus on helping leaders in Asia initiate change and manage progress in their organizations and communities. If you, so right now we are in the midst of a 20 week series with 20 topics. And the purpose of these webinars is really to encourage and educate you during these uncertain times. Uh, the topic of today's webinar is actually aligned with a full workshop, uh, online blended learning course, which we happen to run in Malaysia with the Star Media Group. And we are glad to be able to offer this preview as a webinar and offer you some value during this time. I would now like to recognize our speaker. Samuel Kim is the president of the Center for Asia Leadership. Holding his MPA from Harvard, his main areas of teaching, research, and consulting are in adaptive leadership, futures thinking, negotiations, uh, designing lear learning organizations, among many others. He is the editor of 12 books and has worked with over 40 organizations, including the UN, UNESCO, Samsung, and Toyota. Samuel, thanks for taking the time to join us today. Well, thank you very much, Sean. Hope you're holding up well and things are getting back to normal. Okay, wow, it's uh, almost evenly spread out, but uh, definitely uh, fixed mindset is the number one factor that it seems to be holding most organizations back. So, um, before we start, uh, let me give a bit of introduction uh, to this topic, and then I'll segue to our first question. Um, in the last two months, there is not a single leader that I have spoken to who is not undergoing uh, a difficult trial or what we call, what we can call a crucible experience. Whether you're someone at the top of an organization or on the front line, we are all asking ourselves in one way or the other, what does it take for me to be an effective leader during this time of pandemic? Despite all the uncertainty, how do I understand and define the current challenge? How can I help my team, my organization, or my community make progress in that challenge? One of the ways to approach this is through a framework called adaptive leadership. This is co-developed by our center's global council advisor and Harvard Kennedy School professor, Ronald, Heifert, Ronald Heifetz. The approach is a mindset, tools, and tactics to address complex problems that require managing multiple stakeholders to adapt and make progress. Ultimately, a crucible should lead to the creation of something new. With that introduction, I would like to segue to the first set of questions. So Samuel, uh, what are the first principles of adaptive leadership and how do these principles help an organization make progress during these uncertain times? Well, thank you very much, John, for the first question. Um, if I may, I wanna, I wanna say this, that you know, I really want to thank every one of the webinar participants for your time. Uh, I just saw the chat and some people are, you know, uh, their time is 4, 4 a.m. in the morning, uh, 6 a.m. from all over the world, uh, but I really want to thank every one of you yeah. for giving your time uh, to be present here. I hope uh, what I share today uh, will be uh, useful, you know, maybe providing some good insight uh, to your own leadership journey. So again, thank you very much for, for your time. Um, I want to also mention that adoptive leadership was one of the courses I've taken at Harvard. 
And uh, it was among a few of the courses that has really triggered me to really think about uh, reflecting upon my walk of journey, uh, really looking back about the choices I've made uh, in the past. And also uh, thinking about how perhaps should I uh, use my future uh, for the benefit of the greater good. And so adaptive leadership has been a trigger and it got me to really think hard and it has eventually culminated with establishing the Center for Asian Leadership. Um, so I am just putting that introduction out there that this has been really an amazing course that has really got me to think a lot in many different ways. Now, um, adaptive leadership, um, perhaps the way that I'm going to present will be a little bit different uh, than how this course is taught at Harvard. Um, I'm gonna put this into four parts, and I have, in a way, reframed or recreated this uh, using a lot based on my own personal experience. Um, and so uh, I'm just you know, giving you this introduction that uh, what you read or how you'll be taught at Harvard may not be uh, exactly the way that I am going to present it to you today, okay? So uh, as a segue uh, to answering uh, the question, I want to put this slide out, out there. Um, and then if you look at this first slide, it says making a progress. And I put the human aspiration there. I want to mention that it is everyone's aspiration to make a progress, right? Uh, we, you want to see yourself improving. You want to succeed in your life, right? You want your children to succeed, right? So when we talk about progress, it basically means that you know, today is better than yesterday. And, and, and you know, we are hoping that tomorrow is gonna to be better than today. Right? That's what it means by making a progress. Now, if you look at this word progress in our dictionary, there are two parts. One, um, it's a movement, right? It's not static, it's a movement. There has to be a momentum created by the action. And the momentum comes along with a higher, better, and stronger state. So in other words, again, you know, what we are today, tomorrow through our movements that we create with any intention, tomorrow is gonna be better. It's gonna be higher. We're gonna be achieving a stronger state. You know, as an example, I, I'm originally from Korea, but back in the days, 1960s, 50s, and 70s, uh, it was very common that people ate two meals a day. That was a very common thing. For a lot of the people, their aspiration was to eat three meals a day, and they want to see their children eat three meals a day, right? So that's a progress that they want to make. It's a human aspiration to wanting to achieve a better and a higher and stronger state. Now, uh, if we look at the next slide, I am going to put this into a four part question. The four part question is, first of all, if you want to do something about our reality, or if you want to make a progress, first of all, we got to look at our current reality. First of all, we got to ask this question, what does it look like, right? What does our current reality look like? And perhaps that reality that we look, uh, you know, we, we, uh, we look at is something that we want to improve on, right? The second question is going to be the roadblock. What is keeping us from making the progress that we need? So there's gotta be something, I mean, we, we've got the aspiration and we want to reach a certain point, let's call it point B, but we also realize that there is a, a gridlock, there's a roadblock, something is impeding us, something is blocking us, something is hampering us from making that progress that we aspire to make, right? Question number three, then, if we want to make a progress, but there's something that kind of holds us back, we got to get it right. We got to fix it. Otherwise, if we just let it as it is, it's going to continue to hamper us from making the progress. So I call this a leadership work. The leadership work is that when we realize that there's something that's holding us back, we got to face that and we got to get it right. We got to fix it. And the last part I'd like to mention is the work of self. What is my role in this leadership work, right? We can always you know think about yes this is something that we have to do and we feel that you know some changes has to be done about this we got to get rid of the roadblock but by the day if you don't move yourself if you don't really take ownership of the work then it will continue to be there someone has to be doing the work and that someone is going to be you right so question number one two and three and four this is something that we got to constantly ask ourselves so I'm not going to go too deep into every one of these questions. You know, we're gonna be needing a lot of time, but let me slightly go into um, a, a surface level of what these questions uh, will entail. So next slide, if we look at the next slide, our current, our current reality, what does it look like? There are three parts. If, I, if I'm able to simplify all this, 
um, you know, I, I know the world is very complex, but if you are to really make it simple, um, perhaps we can put it into three different elements, growth, stuckness, and decay. Growth is making a progress, right? We are able to see that we are making a progress. Again, today is better than yesterday. Tomorrow is better than today. So we see that growth happening. But for some people, they say that, you know what? We are in the state of this stuckness. We, we can call this mediocrity. You know, you know, we've got a lot of potential for growth, but somehow we are stuck in the state and we don't see that growth is happening, right? The last part is going to be decay, right? Decay. Decay basically means that, you know what, yesterday was better than today. So you're feeling like that there is something that we can do, but, you know, somehow we are declining. We are in the state of decay. So with this state of growth, stuckness, and decay, we got to ask this question. Where are we today? What does our current reality look like? And we can ask in all levels. Personally, how are you doing? On a, on a company level, for example, your, your workplace, how is it? Is your company you know, able to make some, some growth? Or is it in the state of stuckness or decay? What about on a national level, right? Um, you know, on a national level, I mean, you, you have a lot of uh, potential for growth, but somehow, you know, we are not really realizing this potential that we have. So the very first step, to doing the leadership work is really understanding where we are today. I want to I want to show you this uh, next slide. Um, you know, I'm not sure if you realize uh, this picture here. The first picture uh, on the top. Uh, this is a picture of Myanmar. Um, I'm not sure how many of you know that Myanmar back in the 1950s and early 60s, this country used to be having one of the best education system in Southeast Asia. They had a rich talent pool but we know what it's looking like today. I mean, of course, this country has a lot of potential and it's coming back. And I hope that they, be, they may be able to continue walking on this path, but that's the state that they were in, right? They were in the state of growth, but due to all these political, social, economic factors, uh, they went through a tough, difficult times. Now, I can also show you the next picture. Uh, it's a, a picture of the Philippines. I, I, I actually spent my time, uh, 10 years of my time in the Philippines. Uh, Philippines was a country that my country, Korea, used to look upon. Uh, back in the, I think it was late uh, 1960s when our president visited uh, the Philippines, he mentioned to the president then at the time in the Philippines saying that, you know what, if we are able to just become like the Philippines, there's going to be no other, uh, no other wishes for us, right? That was a role model country that we wanted to become. Well, Philippines right now is coming back, but we also know that what Philippines has gone through. Um, I can also show you some of the pictures of uh, the companies that I, I, I managed. I, not managed in a sense, but I, this was part of the portfolio. Um, I didn't necessarily put some of the companies that no longer exist there today, but um, of some of the companies I've, I've used to work, uh, there are com uh, companies that no longer exist. Or some of the companies, as you see here, are going through tough times. So we cannot look at this from different angles. Um, and we got to ask this question, where are we today? Right now, where are we today? Now, with this, I want to show you the next slide. And the next slide, uh, it was an article uh, in late 2018. And what it said was that these are, I, I know that you, you may recognize some of the, uh, the brands here. Uh, the brands uh, here you see, it says that there are 22 iconic brands, right? These are the US brands. Uh, but it said the title was, there are, these are the 22 iconic brands that may not survive the end of 2019, right? I mean, some of the companies are not there anymore. Uh, some of them are still there, but these companies are having you know, tough times. Um, so, I'm just wanting to put you out there that the very first question that we got to ask is understanding where we stand. Now, after we have understood where we stand, the next very important question, as you can see uh, here, is what is the roadblock? You know, why, what is keeping us? And why, you know, why is it very difficult to solve the problem, right? So what is keeping us from making the progress that we need? And I put up the picture here, uh, elephant, we can call that an elephant in the room, right? Um, these are the things that really mess things around. These are what's causing us, pulling us from the back. You know, we have this aspiration to make a progress, but somehow we are not able to make it. And we can call this elephant in the room. There are lots of elephants of different sizes, of different colors, of different nature existing. Um, now, the very important question that you got to ask is that is the elephant the impact or the real problem. In other words, 
Is the elephant that you see in the room the impact of a deeper problem that we got to surface and understand? Or is this really the problem, right? Um, so I want to give an example of a, a patient and a doctor, right? When you are sick, when you're coughing, maybe the problem is that initially you may understand that the problem that you're going through is coughing. In fact, you know, having this cold. But when you go and see the doctor, the doctor may uh, prescribe you with a medicine, but you keep on having this illness of coughing. And despite that you take up this medi medication, that still you know, is there, it's not going away. So we got to then ask the question then, could this be an impact of a deeper problem that may be causing this to exist despite that I'm taking up the medication? So in that case, the deeper problem could be, for example, maybe it's, it's gonna be a relationship problem, or maybe you know, your workplace is uh, right next to a, a factory that produces a bad air. Um, it could be that you, you, know, you have a, um, a dietary a problem. Maybe you're, you're taking up a, not a healthy food, for example. Or maybe you don't have this healthy lifestyle, or maybe you're not you know, practicing or you're not exercising too much. So it is very important to understand what the nature of this roadblock is, right? Just by looking at, okay, that's gotta be the problem, and therefore you work on that problem, but yet you continue to feel that that problem isn't going away, then you got to take a deeper eye, a deeper understanding of what could be the real problem. So let me uh, run through you, a, a typical, I know that this is quite texty here, I, my apologies for that, but let's look at the outcome here. The outcome, I, as I put it out there, mediocrity, decay, growth, right? Um, we got to understand where we are today. This is the outcome that you see. But then we got to understand how we respond to certain challenges, certain uncertainties. And the way that I want to simplify this is that some people, as we put, you know, put down here, are basically means response, response number one. Some people just don't see that there's an elephant in the room. And therefore, you do nothing about it. And you end up becoming a mediocre organization or a mediocre person or maybe uh, an individual who's going through a decay in their life. The second response is that they see that there's an elephant in the room, but somehow, you know, they don't really, you know, feel this motivation to do something about it, right? So they do nothing. They end up doing nothing. The third response is that they see that there's an uh, elephant in the room, but you put up the wrong response. Somehow you put up the wrong response. I've, been, I've seen many over the past, you know, couple of years in my work, I've seen many companies not either doing, doing anything or putting up the wrong response, ending up in mediocre and decay. I'm going to cover uh, about this later on. Uh, and the fourth response is going to be, they see that there's an elephant in the room, but they put up the a delayed response. But on the other hand, there are companies who see it or don't see it, but they are, oh, you know, they are eager to put up the right response. Or they're always in that preparation mode because we don't know what's going to come, but we got to prepare for these challenges. Now, the common behavior that we see, very common behavior that we see is denial. A lot of people actually, you know, deny that there isn't a problem, right? Um, you know, they see the elephant in the room, but they see that, you know what, we don't have any problem. We are doing well. Deferral, you know, not in my, you know, I don't have the authority to do something about it. It's got to be my bosses, right? So they defer. They don't do it, but I don't want to take up the risk. It's got to be someone else who should be dealing with this. There's a lot of blame game. There's a lot of scapegoating. There's a lot of politics taking place in the organization. Um, also, what about distraction? You know, we get distracted. You know, this is an important work you have to do if you really want to see yourself, your organization, your country to progress. This is something that you have to do. But somehow we are wasting a lot of our energy distracting, you know, being distracted by something else. What about complacency? It's a very common thing, complacency. You know, all the other people are up, jumping up and down, but, um, you know, complacency is a common element. What about obstinacy? The stubbornness, you know, the, the unwillingness to move, do something about it. On the other hand, there are organizations that do well. And I, I'm not going to necessarily go over this, but adaptive leadership, the way I teach this, I was able to identify five things that the organization, the thriving, the growing organizations do well. So next slide, and I want to uh, end the, the first question with this, is that we can even go deeper into these things. For the outcome that you see, the response, the system that you place, the behavior they see, it's relatively, you're able to identify, you're able to witness these things, but you don't just go in and address these behaviors because if you keep on addressing these behaviors, we, in a lot of often times, it continues to stay there. The point I want to make is that we got to go a little bit deeper. It's a mindset issue, the way that we have been brought up, 
right? All these values, the assumptions, how we prioritize things, the identity beliefs, the experience and the education that we have received. All of these are really at the roots of what we see today, the current reality. And so um, I want to, uh, in a way, end here, and then I want to uh, hand it over to John. Uh, but later on, I'm going to uh, address the remaining uh, three questions uh, using some of the examples I have. Okay, go ahead. Thanks, Sam. Uh, so you actually covered, I think, parts one and two of the, the four-part framework. And I, you mentioned that you're going to go over parts three and four. But mm -hmm. maybe, I, think, um, I think it's going to come out when, for, in this next question, which is, what are some cases or examples in business or government practicing some of these principles or uh, in a way that we can help uh, us understand? So. Yes, yes. So if we can go to the previous slide, um, I want to quickly uh, mention this to you, okay? I'm just gonna quickly go over question number three and four. Now, question number three, um, if we want to really get a uh, fix these things, right? The elephant in the room. Um, you know, these are the important uh, parameters or important frameworks that we have to place. And I actually use, uh, you know, this. Um, I am actually working on a book uh, based on this uh, framework right now. But first of all, when you want to do anything about it, as I've mentioned, you got to, first of all, before taking an action, you got to understand what the problem is, right? So you got to really understand, finding the reason for mediocrity and the decline that we're in. Again. If you think that you are in the state of mediocrity and decline, the very first thing that you got to do before taking any action is awareness, this diagnosis. And this is about understanding what is the real cause, right? Yes, you see a problem on the surface, but is what you see on the surface the real problem or the impact or the symptom of a deeper problem that we got to understand? So we got to do that reality check. The second part is that, that why sometimes that, you know, we, we are doing something about it, but why is it so difficult to fix this you know why is the problem difficult to be fixed and we got to then talk about what and who is resisting this right because there's a lot of resistance and, and that's why a lot of these problems are not being able to be solved right so we got to do then the boundary check number three accountability number four responsibility it basically means that how can i use my status and how can i use my credibility to fix these problems this is where the action comes into play and this is really about deploying the means to remedy Mediocre and decline. Med remedy mediocre and decline basically means that we are wanting to turn this reality of mediocre and decline into a state of growth. And so this is how I would use, and this is what I teach about, and this is what I research about. Um, and using this, I you know, am very eager to help um, you know, organizations to turn their reality into a something better state, right? If we go into the next part, the question number four, it is very important to understand the work of the self. What is my role in this leadership work? It's really about taking, uh, taking ownership, right? I mean, one of the behaviors that you saw was deferral. You know what? I don't have the authority to do anything about this. Or it's going to be my boss who should be attending to this problem. Or, you know, you sit back, you know, because I don't want to take up all the risk, right? I don't want to, you know, uh, get blamed for if there's any mistakes uh, that, that uh, you know, for me doing something about it, I don't want to take up all the blame. But if you really want to do something about this, you got to take up the ownership of the work, right? Because I put it down here, you need to solve your own problem. Yes, other people may come and solve, help you solve the problem, but it is you that you got to work on your own problem. The best person to do this is really the you, right? So next slide I want to mention, and I want to give you a couple examples from the corporate side, um, and I want to give you an example of both the decay, uh, you know, the mediocrity and growth. Um, when I talk about the, uh, the owning uh, the self, you know, taking, uh, taking the ownership of the work, um, in, in Korea, for example, you know, in, back in 1997, we had a financial crisis. Yes, the technocrats or the people in the government made a wrong decision. They, were, they didn't really see this crisis coming, right? I mean, it was a huge crisis at the time because um, three out of the, one, of, one in three people actually lost job. I mean, this was like one of the biggest crises that we faced uh, in, our, in our modern history. Um, but, you know, are you going to blame these uh, government people for not doing what they've done? I mean, will the blame and scapegoating and all these th things, you know, solve the problem? No. We got, something has to be done about this. And it was during this time that individuals, right, people, the citizen came out that, you know what, this is a country that we've been building and we've got, we owe a lot of debt. And if you don't receive a lot of these monies, 
uh, that will help our, com our country to co make it make come back, then this country, you know, may, may not have a future. And so what the individuals did was that, you know what, whatever that we have, they can help the country to borrow the money, but at the same time, pay off the debt. We got to be doing this. So as you can see in the picture here, you know, people were basically coming out with the, the gold, the jewelry, the silver, anything that they valued, they brought it out and they um, gave it unconditionally, right, to the, the government saying that, you know what, the $50 billion that we are going to need in order to get our country back, we got to do it. It can be just the government, but we got to work on this. Um, I can also mention in COVID-19, for example, I mean, I, I wanna use the Korean case example, uh, you know, here too, that uh, there were a group of um, medical uh, personnel uh, in other parts of Korea. They said that, you know what, right now in this city where the COVID-19 has, um, you know, has uh, broken out, um, it's our responsibility. I, you know, it is my duty to remain in this hospital and look after the patient, but you know what? The people that are suffering, right? I got to do something about this. So after work, there were hundreds of medical personnel that came down from other parts of the city in Korea to that city where it needed a lot, a lot of work and they would work, you know, after work, after the work in that city is done, they would go back uh, to their hometowns, right? They've been doing this every day. Uh, I've seen also the uh, medical personnel from the military who volunteered, despite that they didn't have to do this. If I don't do it, then you know, the, the problem will be, will be there. So therefore, I gotta be doing something about this and therefore I will do it. That's an act of um, uh, taking ownership of the work. Right now, there are many companies who are you know, taking part in helping to solve these problems right now with COVID-19. But one point I would like to make here is that it's gotta be individual, right? All of us, there's gonna be something that we can do about it. And that, first of all, begins with becoming more aware, having this diagnosis of what does a problem look like and what is my role or what is my part in helping to alleviate or to solve the problem at hand, right? Um, so the next, uh, uh, the question I, I want to raise is that um, if you look at the, uh, the next, next slide, this was a company that used to do well. Uh, I'm not sure if you know this company, a uh, Sears company. Uh, this Sears company, uh, they used to be the biggest in the United States. Um, you know, for the department stores, right? It, it's a, a big uh, store that they uh, sell products. Um, you know, if you look at here, the, um, they have the tower. I mean, it used to be the tallest tower in, in the US. It's based in Chicago, a very well-to-do company. They almost had a 50% of the market share, uh, but we know what happened to this company. This company, despite that people around were telling people that, you know what, there is this Amazon, that's coming up and they're selling products online and you know, they're slowly gaining grounds. You know, we are, our you know, business model is as such where we sell our products offline. You know, when there were people who are kind of raising this bell, right? You know, we got to be watchful. We got to do something about it. We got to prepare. This is the big thing that's coming and therefore we got to be preparing for this. The people, the board members, the, the management people said, you know what? I mean, who's going to buy the products online? It's, it's, a, it's one of the fads. Um, you know, people will want to buy their product, they will want to touch it, they want to feel it, they want to smell it, and after, they are convinced that they will buy, right? The long story short, this 125-year-old company, right, 125-year-old company, despite that, again, many people raising, you know, these alarm bells saying that, you know, we got to prepare, we got to look for this thing that's coming up called Amazon. People, there was a big elephant in the room. This big elephant in the room is the complacency. Um, you know, there, there was a, a lot of deferral. People were not wanting to make decisions. People were, uh, you know, deferring it to some other people. Um, so complacency and all these behaviors were in place. Now, long story short, in 2012, in early 2012, they began to shut down two of the, the stores, the outlet out of the 3,800 uh, outlets that they had. Now, the end of that year, they closed out 172. In August 2018, just within that eight month period, they closed down 866 stores. Two, three months later in October 15, 2018, they filed the bankers. So this is an example of how if you leave that elephant in the room there, right? And if you don't see it coming, or even though you see it, but yet you don't do anything about it and ending up putting a de delayed response or wrong response, then you, the only outcome that you're going to be expecting is the 
decay, or you know, if not, the best is the mediocrity. Um, you know, I have a lot of examples about this. Um, you know, one of the companies I used to work, uh, you know, back in the days, uh, I mentioned this industry last time in 2008, uh, this 161-year-old company um, in the Wall Street. This had collapsed. And in fact, this was the corporate behind bringing 2008 financial crisis. And again, we had one of the best talents around the world. You know, we had, you know, among the best, you know, from top MBA schools around the world. Yet, despite that we had everything that we had, we were not able to predict that this was a, a risk that was coming. And in fact, we are the ones who created the risk. And so um, I have you know, many examples as to how we can describe our reality. If we don't really, the point I want to make here is this, if we do not face the reality, if we don't really have a strict understanding of what our reality is, and then the answer to that is that, you know what, we are somehow in that state of mediocrity or decay, yet, despite that we know it, and not doing anything about it, the only best that you can, that the best state that you can reach is going to be mediocrity, if, if not decay. So I just want to put it out there that adoptive leadership is really understanding what are the brokenness, what are the things decaying in our system? Because we are always fascinated by something that's good and positive. We get somehow fixated. Now, this is the part. You should, we should not be getting distracted by the things that we do well. Yes, for the things that we do well, yes, we got to continue to do it. But the real leadership work is understanding not just about the good things that we do, but what are the things that we got to not do or we need to improve on. And we, again, simplified term, the elephant in the room. If we do not pay attention, if we do not attend to these things that are decaying in our system, breaking apart, then this is going to come, come to us with a bigger problem, with a bigger elephant in the room. And by the time that you're about to deal with it, maybe that elephant has become very big for you to handle, right? Because if you, again, leave that there, it's going to impede you, hamper you from making the progress that you need. Samsung has almost made that mistake. When they had this Samsung Galaxy Note 7 crisis, right? There was a lot of people saying that, you know what, we got to attend to this. These are the things that we got to you know, embrace in our system within Samsung company, right? But a lot of people were saying, you know what? Our company is making so much success right now. And in a way, they really denied looking at the problem. They didn't intentionally, or maybe without intention, try to understand what the elephant in the room until this Galaxy Note 7 crisis happened. Mm -hmm. Now, they were able to survive because they really did something to address this. And in fact, what's interesting is that Someone who actually identified the elephant in the room within Samsung was not the CEO, was not some people who've been there for 25 years. It wasn't the people that had the most authority. It wasn't the people that had so much wealth of knowledge, you know, who have really witnessed the, the growth of Samsung. But it was the person who was the lowest ranks, the spokesperson, the person who wasn't there for, who, who was there for the, sh the shortest time. He was the person who helped the leadership to identify and to really comprehend what that elephant in the room was. So, I mean, I've got a lot of examples of this, but you know, due to the time constraints, I'll just, you know, I'll stop here. Back to you, John. Sam, uh, yeah, Samsung is a fascinating case. I, I know like in the span of two weeks, their market value went from like, from billions, they, they lost billions with the, the Galaxy Note crisis. So just to recap uh, your four part framework, you know, understanding the current reality identifying and diagnosing what the roadblocks are to getting to your aspiration. Number three, uh, figuring out what the leadership interve interventions are, the leadership work, how do we get things right or fix it? And then number four, uh, looking at the self, what's, you know, in order to change what's around me, you have to change, start with, uh, with yourself. So uh, we, we are about to go to Q&A, but um, just kind of summing up a lot of these, these, these lessons. I mean, this is a full, uh, course at Harvard, which you put into like in you know less than uh, fifteen or twenty minutes. What are some of the concrete things that uh, our viewers can actually practice and immediately practice? And you know, just my, uh, mind you, Samuel. We maybe we just have a minute left until we can go until we go to the Q and A um, uh, se uh, section of the the webinar. So uh, maybe you can just sum this up in maybe a minute or so. Yeah. Well, first of all, John, my, my apologies for. No <laughs> Uh, if we go to the next slide, yes, this is a very important question. Um, how, you know, what are the concrete lessons that we can take up through this? Well, I want to put it out to two parts there. 
before engaging any action. I mean, we have this tendency to go straight into taking an action, but let me pause for a minute. I mean, if those issues are time sensitive and it requires, you know, your quick decision making, yes, you, you have to address this. But, you know, what I want to put it out there is that we are not dealing with a simple problem. We are dealing with some heavy problems, right? We really want to see a progress being made in us, right? Of course, you know, a lot of the parents, their aspiration is that they want to see their children making a better life than they, that you personally enjoy, right? But if you really want them to continuously make that progress, that growth, you know, it's not as simple as, you know, just instantly taking an action. So before taking an action, one of the things that you have to do is that you got to observe. Step aside, try to observe what's happening on the ground. Try to diagnose, right? As a doctor, you don't just give them a, prescri a prescription. You got to ask these questions. You know, how do you feel? What are your symptoms looking like, right? So observe, diagnose, become more aware of what's going on, right? So first of all, you got to ask yourself, yourself, are you, could you be an elephant in the room? Could you be the one who's really impeding not only you, but others in your organization or you're in your country to make the progress that you need? Perhaps you may be a catalyst, but in what ways could you be an impediment to you and the community making the progress? The second part is surroundings. What do we see around? You know, surroundings basically means that when you have a meeting in your organization, what do you see? Is there any sort of an you know, elephant in the room? When you work with your colleagues in your workplace, what's happening? You know, is there any elephant in the room between you two? Right? What about at a country level? You know, what are these important progress that we got to make, but somehow we are not making? So it is very important that we got to observe, we got to diagnose, we got to become aware. Now, second part is take ownership of the work, take ownership of the work of leadership. First of all, then you, when you have done the observation work, then you got to think, you got to think. I mean, no one is going to help you do the thinking. Think about what, in what ways, whether it be small or big, what are some of the things that you can do about this, about the situation, about the COVID-19, about these elephant in the room, about this state of mediocrity and decay. So we got to really think about what you can do, then you got to then act upon, right? So these are some of the things I want to make. These are the two, um, two you know, statements I want to make. Albert Einstein said, if I had 20, 20 days to solve a problem, I would take 19 days to define it. Basically it supports the idea that you got to observe. What about Stephen Jobs here? If you define the problem correctly, then you almost have the solution. So observation, diagnosing, and seriously really taking that stance of wanting to become aware, you realize that, wow, I've almost solved the problem. Now I know what to do about this situation. I now know what must be done in order to rectify, to amend, and get this right, right? So observation will give you a lots of hints, lots of tips as to what you, you, can, you can do about the situation. So, um, John, is that, was that one minute? Uh, a, bit, a bit over, but that's okay. <laughs> I, um, it's okay, let's just go right into the questions. And thank you, Sam, for that presentation. Um, so we have, uh, so if you guys have questions, please, or we ha already have some set of questions. If there's a question that resonates with you, feel free to upvote it, and then we will try to work democratically uh, on answering a few of these. So Tess De La Paz uh, asks, as COVID-19 impacts business and individuals differently, what are the emerging competencies expected of an adaptive leader in the current scenario? I mean, uh, you know, COVID-19 case right now is a, is a very difficult case. Um, and I know that a lot of the companies are, have, you know, going through tough times. Um, I, you know, in answering your question, the competencies, um, I'm not really sure, you know, if, you know, the answers I provide is going to be helpful. But one of the things that we need to help uh, is the competency around the topic of people-to-people -people relations. Right now, I think what people really want is people at this time. You know, there's a lots of anxiety here. There's a lot of uh, apprehension, the fear about what's gonna happen to me, my family, the company, and my country, right? It's, it's very tough. So one of the competencies I can say is that, you know, people to people, you know, checking in with, you know, on with people, right? Um, that's one thing that you want to do with people. You know, what's, how are the people that have been working together? You know, a lot of us are basically staying back home right now, but how are these people doing, right? And providing some immediate and real help, if possible, is going to be helpful. Right now, I think is, is the best time for you to do these kind of things, right? Anything that you small do, whether it be small, whether it be big, 
it will be very meaningful, right, for other people. In fact, you know, uh, talking to people, I, I feel this personally, personally too. Um, I was, you know, I've been very busy over the past five years doing this work, but, you know, through this COVID-19, being required to stay home, I took this opportunity to go and reach out to many of my friends. And even just talking to friends, you know, that really relieves some of your stress, some of your anxiety, right? Don't wait for other people to come and reach you. It is very important that you go and reach out to them and be the one to provide, you know, some word of encouragement. Another part I want to uh, encourage is that, you know, maybe with you, you can encourage your colleagues, your family members, you know, the people around you. Let's try to be expressing gratitude personally, at least at one of the five things that you are thankful about, right? You know, these positive mindset is going to really help you understand the situation, diagnose well about the situation well, right? If that anxiety, that fear comes into play, yes, it's gonna be quite difficult. You might somehow misdiagnose. There's a tendency to do that. So it is very important. Try to share that burden with other people, but also try to maintain that positive mindset. And one of the very concrete things that you can do is have a gratitude diary, right? Think about some of the things that you're thankful for personally, but at the same time, express to other people what you, know, you are thankful for them, right? For their presence, for being able to be, you know, knowing them and things like this, right? So I'll just you know, leave it to that. I mean, one last thing possibly could be that, you know, it's a great time for you to pick up some of these skills, right? Um, some of the things that you really wanted to read, but you, know, you weren't able to read it for all these work that you, you know, all these distractions. It's really a great time to pick up some good competencies. You know, it could be uh, the seminars that you really want to take, some skills that you want to take up, competencies uh, about the trends around the world, right? The more you know, the more you are equipped with, you're better able to uh, prepare for yourself in this coming age of the new norm. Thank you. So the second question is from Ip Soon Hu. Um, as of now, most countries, companies, or organizations are mostly reacting to COVID-19. We are just starting to adapt to it. What is the next stage? What should we anticipate will change? And how can we move ahead of the rest? Um, you know, I, I'm not sure if I'm the best person to answer that question. Um, because, you know, I'm also trying to understand uh, what that new normal after post-COVID-19. I, I know that there are a lot of experts who, who are trying to come up with ideas as to what that new normal will look like, but it seems like you know, a lot of people are saying, you know, the second wave is gonna come and unless we have the vaccine, and this is gonna be the North Hemisphere, this, you know, the South Hemisphere thing, it will you know, go back and forth. And somehow we got to prepare. I mean, we just have to accept the reality that we'll have to live uh, with this right now. Um, but I think, um, you know, in the context of adoptive leadership, uh, we really, it requires all of us to really understand. I mean, depending on what kind of industry that you are in, you got to really understand. Yes, this is the reality that we're going to be in. We've been doing all this, you know, all, all very well these while, but now with this COVID-19, wow, it's gonna be, it's gonna become very difficult. I think one thing I can say is that let's not shy away from this reality, okay? Let's not defer, right? Let's not say that, you know what, it's gotta be the board member of the company that should do the work of understanding what the next normal will look like, right? It's got to be us. We got to take ownership of work. Whether you are in the lowest ranks, you're in the highest ranks, whether you're board members, whether everyone has to do that work, right? I think this is really a prime time. I told you one thing that, you know, how can I use the credibility to do the leadership work? It is very important. We got to take ownership of the work by understanding, being industry specific to, to the type of industry that you're in, try to understand what that new normal will look like. How will this really impact us? And in, in you know, using either your boss or your colleague, trying to disseminate, trying to share what you think, how we should prepare for the time to come, right? So taking ownership of the work. So again, the behavior, let's not defer. Let's not be complacent. Let's not get into political game. Let's not deny, right? We got to watch ourselves and taking ownership of the work basically means doing the otherwise, doing the opposite of all these maladaptive behavior practices, right? So one thing I can share is that, yes, take ownership, try to really sit down, observe and think in this context, in our current scenario, what are the things that we can do and share that with the people around you. Share that. And then that can, in a way, 
you know, who knows that through your intervention that your organization, your uh, unit or department may feel that, you know what, I think I, we see a glimpse of hope even in the midst of a deep uncertainty. Okay, so we are running out of time, but we're just going to uh, perhaps go have two more questions. I'm actually going to combine the second to the last uh, question two, two together. So what, this is from Chi We Go, what if the elephant in the room is the head of the company? He doesn't believe in soft skill trainings, he believes in only hard skill technical trainings. And I'm going to combine this with another question. How do you challenge, from Ariel Paran, how do you challenge leaders who seem to have a fixed mindset, believing that they already know it all and things are easier than the way we see them? Um, you know, I, this is going to be a deeper, uh, you know, uh, discussion. Uh, one thing I mentioned is that you should not equate the elephant in the room with a person. Yes, we have that tendency and temptation to define that elephant in the room as a person. But when you, once you define the elephant in the room as a person, then it becomes very tricky. You know, that's where I talk about the resistance. A lot of people are going to resist. There's going to be certain, certain, you know, some reason why that person is behaving in certain ways, right? You know, it's about the mindset. But, you know, when you surface this issue and equate that with a person, that person is going to do all they can to resist whatever that you're proposing, right? So one thing that you got to understand is that, you know what, rather than, Equating that, that behavior issue with that person, you got to really focus on the behavior itself as the problem. That's the adoptive challenge, that's the elephant in the room. So perhaps if you're faced that, you know, uh, the elephant in the room, and, and, and in fact, the head of the company or the CEO of the company is in fact the one who's impeding us from making the progress, sometimes the crisis like this can be a lightning rod, right? Waking that people up that, oh my gosh, Right now, we are in the new reality. And if we don't really fix our behaviors, then we're going to go all down together, right? That could be one thing. But in the normal times, it takes a bit of time. Now, this is the leadership work that you have to do. You got to use your position. You got to use your credibility. If there is any way that you can use your credibility by leveraging on the people that you know, some of the high ranking people that you know, you can share that burden together with them because that person, whatever that you say, will believe you, will trust you, will trust your judgment. So you're using that credibility. What about your position? If your boss doesn't allow it, can you do it? You and the people around you, the subordinates, the people who are working the closest to you, why don't we start something small with them, right? Rather than trying to think big, which is good to have. I mean, you know, these are the aspirations to have, but it is important to start something small and then helping them, seeing is believing, right? Helping them that, you know, it began with your small unit or the organization, but you know what, what you are proposing, in fact, is working. And it's, in, you know, in fact, helping your organization to grow, people are going to begin to accept this, embrace this. So it will require a bit of time. One thing is that we shouldn't be giving up. We have a lot of tendency because, you know, I don't have all the support. I don't have all the people around, you know, and, and my boss is, you know, trying to uh, step down on me. There's a lot of things like this. But again, if you really want to see your company, your country, yourself growing, sometimes you got to toughen up your mind. You got to take up the courage to own this thing because you are the person, if you feel that this is the right way to go, that you got to do this. And so um, that's an important uh, work uh, that you got to, to look at. Now, though, again, one thing, don't try to use this, making the other person feel that that person is being attacked as a person, right? It's got to be the behavior that you got to address. And especially in the Asian culture where the saving the face is a dominant culture, it's a very, sometimes very tricky thing to do, right? Uh, to even speak up or even try to surface or try to, you know, uh, point people to where the problem is. Um, it's quite tough. So we got to do this in a very wise and subtle way. That's where the thinking comes into play. And still, there's a lots of rooms for you to take up on an action. Now, John, if I'm able to um, just slightly mention this, if I can go to the previous slide. Um, I want to leave this with all our webinar participants. And what this is, is that um, the act of leadership, the previous slide, the act of leadership, you know, this leadership work that we are doing, right? The ultimate goal of leadership, okay? The ultimate goal of leadership is helping the state of mediocrity and decay into a state of growth. Okay, previous slide, please. Um, so again, the mediocrity and decay, right? 
the, the goal of leadership is to turn that state, these two states into a growth, the, the, the state of growth. That's the ultimate goal of leadership. Now, the leadership work, okay? The first one is the goal of leadership, what we should aim for. But the work of leadership is how we achieve from that state of mediocrity and decay into a state of growth is what I call the leadership work. So it's about paying attention and attending to things that are decaying and breaking apart around us. It can be you, it can be things within you, it can be things around you. And please, let's face the reality. It's very, very important. It's someone who should do that work, it's gotta be you, right? Next slide. I've mentioned in the beginning about what that making of progress is, right? This is everyone's aspiration. Now it's a movement, a movement that ends up with higher and better and stronger state. But I wanna add, I wanna add one more thing. Whatever the movement that you create, whatever the higher and the better and the stronger state that comes along with this movement, we got to also think about this. It shouldn't be just you that you alone benefiting from all this progress, but the impact that you're creating, the impact coming from this movement that you're creating has to be broadly shared, right? It's very, very important. We got to really think about, I take up this leadership work just not for my own success, but I need to do this because doing this is going to benefit not only me, but the people around us, the community. And who knows that you, your impact, that movement that you create for the better and the higher is going to be good for your nation as well, right? So it is an important work. And I didn't really go you know, too deep into the mindset, but you know, we can actually go into you know, a lot into that mindset issue as well. But it is really important uh, in, in the sense. So for this, leadership is not an easy thing. Right? I mean, it's, you really got to have the courage, and the grit, the willpower to do this. But if you are here today as a um, uh, webinar participants, again, I would like, really like to thank you for your time. I hope that you are triggered, you know, through whatever that I'm sharing with you today. I hope that you feel triggered that I should be the one to making, start making this progress. The progress that comes along, uh, that creates movement, but that then comes along with higher, better, and stronger state but an impact that you create that not only benefits you, but also the community around. Thank you very much, thank you. Uh, thanks so much for sharing all your insights and also for your presentation. I want to apologize to our viewers. We have so many great questions and we just don't have the time uh, to answer it. But, I'll, but in this next set of announcements, I'll share different ways that you can engage with our center in different ways. So um, I'm very pleased uh, to inform you that if you have registered for this live online seminar, you will be entitled to discounts on upcoming programs. So the program which is next on the schedule is this July on how to think like a futurist, uh, developing strategic foresight, which will be facilitated by Samuel as well as our colleague uh, and futurist Rahul Daswani from uh, Singapore. Uh, this program includes six virtual lectures over three weeks, individual and group guided assignments, and as well as personal feedback and coaching. Um, if you have also have registered for the seminar, you are also entitled to discounts on our other programs in September and November, Power, Influence, and Persuasion, as well as Adaptive Leadership. So each of you will be receiving an email about this in the coming days with full details. And we are also available for questions uh, via email as well. Um, next week, uh, as we work our way towards a new normal, how might we create a shared narrative that helps everyone stay productive, relevant, and even thrive? So we will continue our webinar series next week with how to communicate and inspire in times of uncertainty with leadership coach and Center for Asia Leadership faculty, uh, Ami Valdemoro. So you'll be receiving reminders about that um, in the next couple of days. So please do register for that. I'm also very pleased to remind you about that our in-person programs are now, now all available in the online space. So the, the workshops I mentioned uh, on adaptive leadership, on power influence and persuasion, the, on the futures program, even our negotiation programs are now all adapted to the online space. So that as, as you know, we offer all of our programs with Harvard frameworks, Harvard trained facilitators and Asia based cases. And so these, as I mentioned, these include webinars, live virtual lectures, self and group paced learning, and as well as personalized coaching. If you are interested in bringing these learning solutions to your organization, please do contact our team. Um, as another response to the COVID-19 crisis, we are also pleased to remind you that our Center for Asia Leadership online contents 
are all for free for a limited time. So please go to online.asialeadership.org to take advantage of our top courses on leadership and innovation. Um, the next announcement I'd like to make is a reminder about our books, specifically the Rethinking Asia series. So do check out our latest book, Rethinking Asia 6, How Leadership Can Be Taught, uh, which is now available for online purchase on our website. Samuel is working on two other books right now, Rethinking Asia 7 on the future of work, as well as uh, he's co-authoring a, a book also specifically on uh, adaptive leadership. I'd also like to announce that the Asia Leadership Forum, which was originally scheduled for the month of May, has been rescheduled to November, uh, November 6 in Kuching, Malaysia, and November, November 9 in Kuala Lumpur. So please stay tuned uh, for more updates on this. And uh, please do uh, connect with us. Connect with Samuel. He has graciously provided his contact information. Uh, I also encourage you to follow him on LinkedIn, where he posts very interesting content uh, related to leadership innovation and some of the work that we do at our center. Do visit our center's website for more information about what we do and our programs. And please also follow us on our social media platforms for leadership insights, articles, mini videos, and announcements. Uh, my contact information is also there uh, in case you want, would like to follow me as well or would like to contact me. And I wanna thank our partner, Star Media Group, for their support. Please do follow them on their website as well as their social media platforms. They are also responding to the COVID-19 crisis and exercising leadership by offering many public goods uh, to the society. And I wanna thank you, them for that. Uh, I wanna thank Samuel, uh, uh, as well as my team at my center. And if you could fill out the exit survey that will pop up when you leave, we really do take your feedback very seriously. So please do, uh, please do complete it and we will take them seriously to continue uh, improving our programs moving forward. And thank you all for your time today. We ho do hope you have a, a wonderful rest of the day. And if you are on the other side of the world, we hope that you have a nice rest. And I do hope that you and your loved ones do stay safe and healthy during this time. Uh, with that, thank you so much, and we hope to see you again next time. Thank you.